Good morning everyone. It is wonderful to have you listening in to our webinar, School Zone versus Work Zone. What's the difference? This webinar is proudly brought to you by the National Road Safety Partnership Program or NRSPP in partnership with ARB Group and of course the Downer Group. My name is Rosemary Patterson and I'll be your moderator today. I will co-moderate the session and provide tech support so we just click through. Thank you, Jim. My esteemed colleague, Jerome, who manages the NRSPP and its many activities, joins me in the studio as our primary moderator today. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Thank you, Jerome. For anyone joining us for the first time, could you tell us a little more about NRSPP and its purpose? Certainly. Uh, the NRSPP has been established to provide a collaborative network for Australian businesses and organisations to help them create a positive road safety culture, both internally and externally. It aims to help all organisations of all sizes across all sectors to share and build road safety initiatives specific to their own workplace and beyond. It's delivered by ARB and funded primarily by Government Coalition and ARB. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from Jim today. This has actually been uh, one webinar I've been lining up for a long time. So it's a, with a pleasure we can actually hear all about Jim and the experience at Downer. Good morning. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Rosemary. And, uh, We'd like to thank Jerome for getting this happening and thanks to Jim. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Jim to the studio today, Jim Appleby. Jim is currently National General Manager Road Surfacing for Downer Infrastructure Services. Jim has strong expertise in the areas of strategic business management, team leadership and complex contract delivery in roads, highways and airfields. Jim joined Downer Infrastructure in 2011 with a vision of zero harm workplace through embracing behavioural change. Jim has a passion for the asphalt industry and its people. So over to you Jim, let's get started. Hi, good morning everybody and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about what I think is a critical subject um, for road safety and particularly those that work on it. Um, the, the presentation is titled School Zone versus Work Zone and uh, what's the difference and really I'm posing a question to you, the, the audience, regarding that. As you can see on the slide, we, we, have, we have two very similar situations, the School Zone and the Work Zone, both of which many people interact with on a regular basis, both of which are mums and dads employed and moving and working around an area managing traffic and managing the safety of people on foot around that. Both require drivers to observe limits and respect the work they're doing in order to do it safety and allow the sites and the public to function around that. One's controlled by a crossing assistant or as I would term a, a lollipop lady or gentleman and the other's controlled by a traffic controller. Um, and the reality is, to me, there is no difference. But there are some startlingly different facts when you dig under the surface. And I'm going to focus very much on our, our work zones because of the data we've collected and amassed over the last few years. And just to point out, between January 2012 and July 2016, we've recorded 3,665 near misses of members of the public doing the wrong thing as they travel through our work sites. Now, every night we have up to 2,000 people on the network facing some quite serious dangers, um, many which we aren't directly in control of and, and the public play their part in. And this data is, is profound about, about the dangers we're facing, which is why we wanted to con compare it to a school zone where I think you'd see the levels are, are vastly different because of how the public perceive the uh, the work that's going on. How, how different is that? Why, why would that be? I think, um, and rightfully so, the crossing assistant is, is held in very, very high esteem in the community. They're there protecting our future generations, our children. And I think a 40 zone is, you know, people are compelled through their moral obligation to, to obey the speed limit. And you know the cross and assistant is there doing some dutiful work for our future generation. I think that's the view of the public. I think, in terms of the roadworks, we considered a nuisance. And the training of those two people, 
What difference is there? Is it much between a lollipop and a controller? Almost identical. The service they offer is almost identical. It's keeping the public and the traffic and pedestrians safe around their work zone, their work zones outside of a school or on a road. So almost identical activity. And we've got an interesting comment from John. Do you want to read that, Jerome? Or? Certainly. Surely the difference is that the police enforce legislated rules. They don't enforce a nice to have. I think that could be a valid point, John, and maybe someone will explore as we move through the, the next few slides of the presentation. So what we see in our work sites is, you know, the 3,665 we've broke down into three areas. So these are re reported by people from our work sites, and as you can see, we've got 44% or 1,600 just over people breaking the traffic rules or just careless driving. Nearly 900 occurrences of speeding and as we all know, speed kills, above 40 kilometers an hour, you're literally in the lap of the gods as to whether you survive on impact or not. And, and really worrying is the 32% of verbal and physical abuse, and I mean physical abuse also. So over, over nearly 1,200 cases where the public have felt the need to interact with us when actually we're trying to do our jobs. The worry is that that's going up dramatically. We're seeing more and more of this abuse coming back to us, which tells me fundamentally there's something not right. Is, is there specific areas? Is it happening more in regional? Is it happening more in certain states? Or is it happening more in cities? Or wh where's this sort of aggression coming from? When you when you look at the, the, the data and break it down, and remember we use data for this. This isn't guesswork. We see the metro areas or the big cities, the, the main conurbations, where it's dramatically higher. Um, in the regional, I've got to be honest, the regional data shows actually that the, the drivers and the interaction with the public is much better and, um, and inherently our guys feel much safer, even on the higher speed roads. And that abuse factor is, is, is profound. Interesting. Um, actually, we've just got a question through here from Don. Has any research been done on how many incidents occur at school crossings under supervision of a SCS? I, I haven't got access to that data, but what I did do is do a bit of Google mining just to see what I could pick up. Um, I couldn't find many incidents at all. I could find one reference in the Courier Mail last year about they'd seen 70 acts of speeding. Um, through a, through a school zone, um, and that was picked up data. So, um, from what I've seen, and the data I can mine, it is far safer than it is on a road website. I'm just going to give you a, a few seconds just to have a look at maybe one or two examples of the words spoken by people who call our NEMIS line, and this is their words, not our interpretation to give you some understanding of, of the abuse and the situations they face in their words rather than ours. So I'll just give you a few seconds. Just while our audience are reading those through, Jerome, which ones um, sticks out for you? Well, there's multiple ones. There's, there's ones here when I think people don't realise how abuse affects people. Like abuse the TC and had a female TC almost in tears. And another one when they're actually getting things thrown at them. So what are these sort of things being thrown at and then how these at what do you do to deal with some of these people and, and the abuse they have to put up with on the roads how's it how do you find that as a, as a, as the manager of them all you know we we have a we have a, a legal and moral obligation to our staff to keep them safe we try and do things around around their well-being and promote things like conflict resolution but as a car comes past he's gone you know, I can tell you first hand I was I was hit by a bottle once on the M4 in Sydney um, and and this is the sort of things we face, and this is just their words. You know, we 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 take it really seriously, which is why we're here today, to try and enlist some help towards making it a little bit of a, a better experience for those doing the jobs. And what's the sort of makeup of the workforce that's out there? Are you, are you, are you guys are out there? Yeah, interestingly, our, our traffic controllers, I'd say, around about 60, 40 percent, 60 men, 40 40 ladies. So it's actually a really balanced workforce. 
Um, we find we find female traffic controllers particularly at, at superb at diffusing situations. You know, the, 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 they really are much more in tune with that, um, and and we look for a balanced workforce here. Awesome. We've had two questions there, Jerome. Would you like? Well, we, one of the ones we've got here, we can sort of hold through because I know um, Jim will be answering that in a moment um, about where the data's come from and how you you pull that together. So that's something to look forward to very soon. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for the questions. Keep them coming, and we'll um, ask them along the way. And this is one of the main questions. So, the experiences I've just told you about on the roadwork site. If it was a school zone, what would happen? And I've just put down there five points that I think would come into action very, very quickly. Double demerits. If you want to speed through a road where, um, a skill zone, you're gonna you're gonna face a penalty. There will be press interest. You know, I found one one article in uh, the Courier Mail recently. Um, however, if this level of information was being sought from crossing assistance, the press would be all over it. There would be public outcry, I can assure you. If it was going through the school zone of my little girls, there would be a public outcry. There would be political involvement. Politicians would be enlisted to drive change. And we think there would be immediate action with this level of data that we've picked up if this was a school zone. So I actually think the school zone and the work zone are out to kilter when it's doing exactly the same job. And for those of you out there, we received an interesting, um, we had the list from Jim of, of, of some of the things his staff has put up, and uh, Evans raised a really good one here saying, uh, in Queensland, there was even a traffic controller who was shot at last year. Not with Diana, but another traffic controller nonetheless. Yeah, it, it, it's terrifying. It's a, it's a terrifying thought, and you know we, we need to, to drive a behaviour or change to make it more palatable. So for you, how do you, I guess we'll be touching this very soon and further, but thinking about how do you supply your staff with a safe workplace? We, we start at elimination as you should in, um, in eliminating risk. So we would prefer a road closure wherever possible to limit the amount of interaction we have to have with the public. But we also take our obligations really seriously, you know, conflict resolution better planning to make it easier for the public to navigate our works, trying to take away some of those frustrations that we can inflict upon ourselves occasionally. Um, working with the likes of um, TMC in Sydney, who, who are very methodical about how they allow works to happen on the network to try and reduce the effect that, that road works cause. There can be congestion quite obviously for closing roads and closing lanes. So in a much more um, organised fashion, but you know the, the challenges will always be there, and you know it's really interesting. To me, we spend our life fixing what every motorist breaks. All we're doing is repairing the damage that the cars and the trucks and all of the vehicles do to the network, and we get abused for it. Now, in my eyes, if we stop doing that, if this industry said no more, we're done. It will be very quick to see how public opinion would change and drive it when the roads weren't passable can't get to work, the economic infrastructure, the country is affected. You know, this is a serious subject. You know, and that's all we're doing. We we aren't out there just for the good of our health, we're out there repairing the network. It's what we're employed to do by the public. And you know, we we have to face peril for that. And lots of drivers, don't get me wrong, we, we interface with huge amounts of the public. And the, the public sentiment is always reasonable with the majority. However, you know, there are people out there who who clearly see us as a as an issue when we're just trying to fix what the very car breaks. As got, a perception. Got weather and everything as well to battle. We we have multiple conditions, you know, we, we zero harms at the at the heart of our business and I know if I was speaking on behalf of any of our competitors, they're no different. And you know, we, we have to we have to worry on multiple fronts and manage our risks on multiple fronts. So every bit of help we get can only be assistance. And, and looking at some of the feedback coming through as well, it, it appears even some of the school zones aren't alone. Like uh, one fellow, David, highlighting how my wife is a crossing supervisor and she's given up reporting drive-throughs because they never get acted on. So we need more education on to drivers understanding the laws applicable to work zones and children's crossings. We have to create that link to people. 
you know, your car will, in an argument between a car and a human being, I've never seen one report of a human being winning. And I genuinely believe we don't have to accept this is the status quo. We, we, we're better than this in this society. We're in a wonderful country. We have a, a, a wonderful life and we, we should accept better. Just to give um, uh, one of the questions earlier was about where the data comes from. So we use a near miss line to identify it. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview as to how that works. So a near miss is a report and it has a really complicated definition which is there on the screen. I'm not going to try and read it because I get lost halfway down. But in essence, if the box falls on the chap's head, that's an incident. If it falls anywhere near where he thinks it's unsafe, that is a near miss. So what we're trying to promote is people reporting things that nearly happen. And it's based on a theory from a guy called Frank Bird, uh, who came up with Bird's Triangle. He went across industry, looked at two and a half million incidents, and came up with the following synopsis, really. And what he said is that for every fatality you've had, there will have been 10 times there's been a serious injury in that category. He said there's also 30 times there'll have been a, a minor injury in that category. But really interestingly, what he also said is that of over 600 times, there will have been a near miss. Now a lot of people look at the triangle and say, so if you get the 600 and one near misses, somebody dies. The important word is over. So there will have been at least 600 times it nearly happened. So we use Bird's Triangle to try and create some data, and we use this as our philosophy. So down in EMS, and I'll give us a little plug that we call it, mate, that was bloody close. Um, the bloody was a slightly different word at the start, but I got overruled. Um, but it's built on the values of Australian mateship. And you know, it's been going for four years. It's, it's a very simple theory for our guys and girls to understand. You ring a telephone number, you leave a message. At that point, we deal with the whole data stream, the trend analysis, the feedback to people who've called. So it's really simple. And that's why we think our teams like it. It's not a big burden to make it work. And the picture at the side's Beaconsfield mine disaster. And we put that up as a great example of Australian mateship. But as we've got into this, the reality is the mine disaster could may possibly have been avoided had the near misreporting have been better. So it's a double-edged sword now. How interesting. And that's the report. So you may think, oh, that doesn't sound too many. Uh, I would hazard a guess, and certainly on talking to other people from the construction industry, the level of reporting within the, the downer roads business is, is, is mammoth. So to give you an example, most companies will tell you 100 reports a month is exceptional. We're getting nearly 1,000 reports a month at the moment. So the culture of reporting is really good on a full range of near misses, not just about the public, but about some of the things we get wrong as well. And so we've got 17,500 data points to actually do trend analysis. But is that a bad thing that there's so many reports coming in? Does that mean things are going bad or what does that mean? Until you understand the depth of the issues, um, you'll never understand the real problems and how to solve them. Some people would say, you know, you've got that many near miss reports, you must be really unsafe. If you look statistically, our, our lag indicators, our LTIs and MTIs are extremely low. We, we are well ahead of what the mining industry would operate at, who are considered the, the benchmark. So our lag indicators support that our safety performance is really good. I actually think this is realistic of what's really going on in the world. I think you know it is a dangerous environment, and not having a line of sight, you know, ignorance is not bliss. Just because you don't know about it doesn't mean it's not happening. I'd encourage anybody to open into near misreporting to get a real understanding of where the challenges are that they face. As I've said, it gives us lots of data, and we can look at data in many, many different ways. So we can look at it by state, location, business unit, 
by time of the day, by the person reporting if they wish to leave the name, um, and, and all manner of different approaches. And I, and I put this slide up with some, some shame, to be honest, but data is the source of all truths. At a, a conference last year in Sydney, um, I presented and I, I suggested using the data we had, understanding where we are, how many traffic controllers we have, how many traffic controllers we believe are in Australia. I predicted within 28 days there'd be a, a serious incident involving a traffic controller in Australia. And I'm, I'm really sad to report that I was wrong by one day. I'm really sad to report that it happened at all, but a TC in Queensland, not in the downer business that they had, um, was tragically killed by a member of the public. So data being the source of all truths is important. I can remember getting the uh, email from you when you said, look, sadly this has happened. Yep. And at that conference I told people we had 28 days to change our change our ways and change our business and yeah, it, it's a constant challenge. You know, we, we have to see it for what it is and do things about it. What we use Birds Triangle for is to think differently. And this is at the heart of Nia Miss really, is we don't think it's just one triangle. We think Frank was slightly wrong. I don't know if Frank's still around to tell that, but that's just our interpretation. Because Nia Miss is built on this. So we think the more Nia Miss data you're getting, the more people are reporting, the more opportunity you have to stop the incident. So the blue is the nothing's happened, nobody's been hurt. Everything above the blue is somebody has been hurt or something has been damaged. So the more you understand, the more the more chances you have to reduce that, and that's reflected in our in our safety performance as well. So it seems to to bear fruit. We're, we're comfortable with the approach we have. And when someone makes a identifies a near miss, do they provide a solution, or they or do they have the opportunity to do that as well? It's really interesting as you as we watch this change over time, where rather than now just report, many people are telling you what's happened and what they've done to fix it. So we think the near miss reporting line, as well as several other initiatives we've done, has started to change the DNA of our people to become proactive rather than passing the responsibility to everybody else to solve it, which is, which is um, gratifying when you, when you read it. People are thinking differently, and that's where we wanted to go. We're working on several things. You know, all the problems don't sit with the public. Trust me, we have many of our own. We're more than aware of that. Around traffic movement, particularly, and public interface, we put certain exclusion zones into play. You know, we spent a lot of money this year making sure we rolled out a really simple rule, which has gone down really well in our business. Um, we've used GoPro surveillance, putting a GoPro on the front of a traffic controller so we can actually see what they see. And uh, I kid you not. Sometimes it's terrifying watching a 55-ton B double career down the road at 100 kilometres an hour, then move over at the very last minute. Um, you know, this is why this is a serious subject. You know, this is the sort of thing that goes on. Do you think the uh, the traffic control is crossing their fingers a few times behind their back, hoping for the best? We we try and institute some some really formal rules around you are never to be in the line of fire. You always to stand to the side. You know. You, that, that's just asking for trouble. You know, a moment relapse in one person could could cause profound issues. So always be prepared. We we always light our traffic controllers so they're well seen. Um, so we have some procedures as do as to most companies and many traffic control companies around around that sort of thing. Conflict resolution training is really important. Effective worksite management. Uh, what's a red zone? So the red zone is. Um, it's our um, no-go area on our own site. So we, we, we have exclusion zones. And rather than use words like exclusion, which sound incredibly silly in an accent like mine, we, use, we call it the red zone. And our red zone is 10 meters behind or 10 meters in front of a vehicle for the full width of the vehicle. And you're not allowed to enter it full stop. How do you arrive at 10 meters? We actually engaged our, our, uh, our workforce. We, we got a we call them the baker's dozen, 13 practitioners, not managers, not people who sit and read emails all day, but people out in the field who have to work with rules to make them effective to come up with that rule, and that's, 
that's the rule they came up with. We're really happy about we have an engagement model for change, and so it's driven by operatives from the field for the field. There's a whole list of other things we've done there, banning mobile phones, which I think is uh, is important. Checking our signage, lots of people who drive through when you get the feedback get very frustrated that our signage is not good enough, and if, if they go from one of our work sites to a different work site, the signage changes, so we, we double check and we audit our signage quality to make sure we're giving members of the public as much opportunity to, to get the information as possible. And just while we're drawing on that, we've got a really interesting question here from Karen, and she sort of made the point that uh, there's a worksite she was going through that's 40 k's now, and drivers are regularly travelling through at 60 k's. Um, this was mentioned to the council. They put a speed display trailer out um, with a radar facility as well, and immediately drivers slowed down. So the question is, looking at this sort of research, is there much research conducted around the signage of work zones? Yes, um, we, we've done both covert speed and um, using the, the board Karen mentions to advertise and check speed, and it does make a difference. What we have found, however, it makes a difference when they go past the sign for the length of the sign, and then they speed back up. So, so people will react to the sign and slow down almost like a school zone, but once they're through the sign, we've seen many cases of it speeding up. So we, we have um, a traffic management division in Queensland, a guy called Andrew Clements, who's done some fabulous trials with various methods of um, trying to understand human behaviour. Um, and You'll see a little bit of that when we talk about the emotive link. So yes, we have. Yes, it does have a positive impact, but the impact wears off if people realise there is no um, penalty with it. And so over time it sort of diminishes as well, do you think? Absolutely right. I mean, we've seen that if we're on works for multiple days and the sign's there, it has an impact on night one greater than night two and greater than night three. Just want to finish up with the back to blue. You know, we're, we're an organisation who, who um, pride ourselves on understanding our work teams and the, the troubles they face. And all managers in in down the roads go back to work in the crew for a week a year. Um, without you know, everybody has to do it, and it's been an enlightening experience for all managers to help us hone where we need to focus on our safety. So, have you have have you gone through that yourself? Yeah, I did it on spray sealing crew in the Pilbara. Um, 43 degrees every day, but you know it's good enough for the goose. It's good enough for the gander. Um, it was actually a really enlightening experience. I also did a week in Sydney, and the difference in driver behaviour is incredible. So you're looking at these huge road trains moving up and down. I, I couldn't remember the name of the freeway. I'm sorry. Um, in the regional areas, and they work with the traffic controllers, so they know the road works on. They'll slow down. You know, sometimes we'll have the road shut for several minutes. They'll park up. They'll wait with a deal of patience. The professional drivers that, that circumnavigate Australia are extraordinary, and actually help rather than hinder. In Sydney, it was like a battleground. You know, there was one guy stood on the bonnet of his car so he could throw abuse from a slightly higher level than if he'd just been doing it out the window whilst waiting for us to reopen the road. So uh, I know that's very um, broad span to give you the two examples, but I do believe the regional the regional routes we get far more help than, than we do in the metro areas. Extreme examples there. Rules are great, but what we're finding more than anything now is that is that people are desensitized almost because of what they see on TV, you know, if you look at the cigarette packet now, if, if you smoke cigarettes and it shows you a picture of somebody in a terrible state, we, we think there's been a lot of desensitised to people about shock horror tactics. It's no good me showing people pictures of traffic controllers who have been mowed down. We, we've done a little bit of research and I've got to be honest, we stole some good ideas out of the TAC and I, I, I say that um, with me and they've, they've come up with some fabulous stuff. Because we're very much focused on the emotive link to the public now. We're trying to create the understanding that the people on the roads are actually people. And you might well know one. If you think there's only 22 million people in, in Australia, I would hazard a guess everybody knows a traffic controller. Everybody. 
if you think, what is it, seven steps of separation? Doing Kevin Bacon, yep. Yep, the Kevin Bacon. Um, you know, everybody will know one, and we're trying to create that link that, for all you know, this could be your friend. And the, and the links are even smaller now. 4.2, apparently, if you have Facebook. So, again, we, we've done some trials out of our Queensland business under Andrew Clements and Nevin Boone, so if you need any information, I'm happy for anybody to get in contact with the guys up there. Here's a couple of examples. So, using VMS to highlight that these are parents, these are real people. You know, when somebody gets hurt on a work site, you would be amazed at how many people it touches. You know, I've, I've had I've had one death in my time. Um, a story that's been well regaled, and some of the audience will have heard it. And he was my first boss, and Colin died, but the the effect was huge. I would hazard a guess it touched ten thousand people, directly or indirectly, because of families, associations, friends, and you know. We've, we've tried to create that link back, but these are people, these are real people, these are potentially your friends. So, you know, give them a hand. So the right's the sign, and a fabulous idea, we actually uh, put a cut out, and this was the approval of TMR, who were happy for us to do this trial, of the, the dad with the two children. There's a cut out on the site, and Andrew's monitored driver behavior around that. I'm just waiting for the results to see if it's changed. But it's all about this emotional link thinking there is a cause and there is an outcome related with my, my actions. Try to make them a lot more personal. Do, do you think some people disconnect the people on the work sites to, are they, do they sort of viewed as equipment possibly or they just don't view them as, well they actually, this is their work, this is their, their workplace? Oh yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, there's a, there's a, there's a fabulous advert I saw some time ago, I think it's actually out in the UK, where it shows a car driving through a school classroom and through a, a surgeon's theatre, um, and asked the question, would you do that, and why would you go through somebody else's work zone any differently? Um, I, I think we're just seen as a nuisance. I don't think people can connect with the value we actually bring, and I'm sure we're playing our part in that. We're really interested for some feedback, but you know we're not seen as adding value when actually we keep in the essential network of, of Australia operational, seen as an inconvenience. Well, and there's a question here from Paul that says, and make, or makes a comment, I, this is the fact that drivers are not educated about science. Do you think that's a factor? That's a really good question. The, the answer is I, I don't know. I think I think we can become almost overwhelmed by the amount of signs advertising around these days. I know Boris Johnson, the Mayor of London, took almost half of the road signs down because he believed there was too much information. It's not about what they see and it's about how they behave and when they get there. That, that's what I would say. Would, you know, The driver behaviour, irrespective of the sign, isn't changing as they go through the roadworks. And I don't know how much the sign would drive change, and that it would certainly help. Good signage always does it, prepares people. And what we're seeing is governments start to give people better expectations that your journey will be disrupted, and it will be disrupted by X amount of time. Interestingly, to slow down and drive through a 40 kilometer an hour work zone, which is about, say, I don't know, say it's a kilometer long, that costs you about 20 seconds of your life, that's all. And what would you say also, because like one of the common issues that pops up, and people go, oh, look, there's a work site out, no one's on it. Where are they? Yeah, I think I think we, we are masters of our own downfall in some situations. The problem with a lot of road repairs is they move, move horizontally very quickly. So you've got to give them enough work and enough space to keep it moving, and you can't reset the start point. So you can't take it off, put it on, and keep that work moving. You know, we, 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 we have to provide an efficient delivery to the network, so that there may well be gaps. We, we also have seen examples from around the industry where we haven't exactly got it right. That's not us taking the moral high ground. We have, we have issues to resolve of our own as well. But I've got to be honest, I, I don't think they're as often as people tend to remember. And an interesting comment there, the higher the income, the worse the attitude. 
talking about um, the areas that some people travel through are better for workers. We, we tried to do some geographical checks to see if there are any hot spots and it, it, we don't believe it's based on society, we based it believe on the network. There are some, so I, I would say the M4 is a classic example of a real hot spot because people face trials and tribulations every day. Um, we, did, we did some work for um, some tunnels in Sydney and the client we worked for there, a company called Transurban, were fabulous. You know, they got us some assistance when we knew we were going into a particularly difficult area and they actually got police presence. Uh, on the night that the police were there, he actually um, arrested somebody for dangerous driving because he swerved at a traffic controller. Wow. You know, what, what, what on earth, and he did it to impress his girlfriend, that's what he told the policeman. What uh, is that about? And she was particularly impressed when she had to get the bus home because <laughs> he, 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 he impounded his car. So what do the police think when they actually have to sit on site and actually provide, do they, do they sort of, are they aware of the risk that you guys, and what you guys have to put up with? Yeah, Queensland particularly, actually in, in many examples, make a, make a part of the contract to have a policeman there, and we do see some positive impacts from where the police are, but again, people's behaviour changes when the out of sight, out of mind. But yeah, there has been some positive impact. Not, no, there's a cost impost to society for having a policeman sat to make sure you're going to do 40 kilometres an hour. Imagine, imagine if we had to put a policeman in every school zone. At that point, society is really broken down. Mm. I'd rather a policeman was out there keeping us all safe from dangerous people, not a traffic controller with a lollipop stick. Exactly, exactly. We, we also begin the emotive link, and I just want you to, to mention and give you the opportunity maybe if, if you'd like to, to have a look at this foundation, so the Georgina Josephine Foundation. We've aligned with these guys because, you know, I won't tell you that, go and have a look at the website about about Peter, the, the father who, whose daughter tragically died under the wheels of his own ute. And their story is incredibly similar to ours about safety of people, safety of pedestrians, safety of people on foot around vehicles. And these are our charity partner this year. Their story is amazing, two of the most amazing people I've ever met, Emma and Peter, who, who sort of dedicated their life after the death of their two-year-old daughter to try and to keep people safe. And my message about roadworks is really important to me. I would ask everybody to go and share the dangers around your house, your driveway, your neighbor's driveway with the people who you're around. 17 children have died under the wheels of a vehicle in this situation on average per year. That is, that is a horrifying statistic. Something needs to change. So we're trying to work with these guys to, to promote the work they're doing and to promote the message to try and keep our children safe. Most of the time it's a, it's a relative as well. Do you think this also resonates with that that problem group as well, I guess the 18 to 24 young male, is this a pathway into their psyche to say, look, this is a high risk environment, the road network, this is what can happen? Anything that gets into the psyche, I've got to be honest, we immediately jump to the fact that many of the people, and I think it's a common misconception, many of the people who are abusive at roadworks are young drivers on pay plates. I don't think that's the case. Talking to our teams, it's across society. In fact, the pay platers feel probably a little bit more vulnerable because if they break the rules, the penalties to them are greater. You know, if they're caught speeding, from what I understand, if they've got any alcohol in their blood when they're driving, and you know, when you're on your plates, the rules are tighter. I can tell you, you know, there's been it. It, it doesn't have a. It doesn't have a an income basis, it doesn't have a creed, a colour, a religion basis, it's right the way through society. And you know, to have a traffic controller run over on purpose by a woman whose daughter was late for a Jim Carner, for example, in her words, not mine, it, it just touches every part of society. It's about, I think it's about how you are and who you are and where you place your values. But it's quite deep. I guess that aligns with um, Safe Work Australia released a report a week or two ago and it was looking at some trend lines and in serious injuries and over the last decade there's been a doubling 
in person to person serious injuries. So it sort of aligns with what you're saying. And there's one more got uh, one from Monty here as well. Uh, do you think people get conditioned when signs are left up and work is not occurring? Yeah, that's a really good point. And yes, I could see why that would be a frustration because it's unnecessary. And quite rightly, as Lonnie said, and I think David also pointed out, we 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 really need to up our game and become more responsive to the, the public needs as well. So I'm not saying this is a one-way train. We've got to all play our part. And how do you think like the smaller operators, like David sort of asked that question, the smaller operators don't cover or remove the signs. So I guess there's a common sort of theme coming through. Yeah. You've got to be careful. There are, there are some standards we have to follow. You have to leave certain signage in place. So there might be no work going on, but yeah, depending on the condition of the road or the work being undertaken or the potential drop-offs at the edge, you might have to leave signage up. And that signage might have to slow you down for public safety. Maybe we don't transmit the message about why it's being left out sometimes. So there is an element of that, but there is an element of um, where we've got to install better practice. I'd agree. But you're doing lots of listening, Jim. I'm doing a lot of talking today, though, Rosemary. Aren't I? <laughs> Just a couple of examples of, of the good work that's going on. So this is a, a sign that I use by Vic Rhodes. Um, create the link between the granddad, the granddaughters, and he could well be the one on the work site. So the whole industry is having a push at this, and that's why we need public help. Unfortunately, these two videos don't work, but I would really suggest you you have a look at them. And when you talk about the emotive link, this is this is it in creation. NT government have have, have sponsored by the traffic management community or traffic control community a video to be made, and I say it won't play today, sadly, but um, it's linking the fact that, you know, this is somebody's relatives who are doing this work, and the NT government have been great. I, I saw this on during the Olympic coverage at 7 o'clock, prime time TV. This advert was on TV, and to me, it, you know, it's fabulous to see government picking up the mantle and doing some of the heavy lifting around this. And is this really the first time any governments, like we saw the the billboard, but is this the first real major ad advertising approach? And sort of Karen asked a really good question, actually asking around campaign. So this is what we're feeding into right now. Yeah, so I think I've seen a few examples that there's one from TAC, which I just think was a game changer. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant advert. Um, but the campaign is out there, and I think government are aware, and we, we use data like we collect and other companies to show them the risks, and, and government are reacting. You know, government reacting. Public changing is our, our perfect world. And this advert, so this is a guy called Francesco. This is a TAC advert. Anybody in Victoria may well have seen it. It's possibly the best advert I've seen in many, many years to make you think differently. Um, this guy is not an actor. Um, and when the 70 people walk around the corner, watch the change in him, and then put yourself in that position. and. I think it opened my eyes that the way to get public to change isn't to sit there and bash them over the head with a big stick and have double demerits. It's about creating this emotive link to an outcome where if something goes wrong, it could affect them. Because the question put to Francesco was, how many people do you think should die on Victorian roads every year? And the number he chose was 70. And so then around the corner walked 70 of his family members. And sitting in the audience when we when it was launched for the first time, and I must admit, there's not many ads that give me goosebumps. And you're sitting there, and, and the whole audience, you can just feel it trickle down. It, it, it's one of those stop moments. Then, and it, it had a profound effect on me, and it's been shared around our business, and it really helped us shape our engagement model with our own teams, and a different way to approach it. You know, go cut fingers. Nobody nobody takes any notice no more. This is just an incredibly good advert. Fair play to TSA. I'll give them a, I'll give them a wrap. It, it changed our view. Um, and recently, I saw one with a, with a, with a, where the interviewing young people who were drive and text and Facebook and Snapchat and things like that. Not that I know what it all is, to be honest. But um, and then then a young lady comes in That's and the, sits down, and explains how her parents got killed by somebody who'd been doing that, and you see the power in the messages is extraordinary, and 
that's why that emotive link is is really we think the future of of creating a connection to 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 the human psyche. Yeah, that's the new AT and T ad open from the US, and those kids were boasting about their behaviour, how good they could Snapchat, what they could do while they're driving. They weren't boasting after they sat down with this young lady for twenty seconds, were they? And we'll we'll send those links to the videos with the recording to our audience. So we've just got a couple of questions before we go into this one. Um, perhaps the signage could differentiate between work zone um, from Melbourne Blosh and change conditions. So when, when road workers are present, are you, are you able to actually provide a clearer indication with regards to when they're on, on, the, on the site and not on the site? I think that's a really good point. I'll follow up on that one, Melvin. Um, thank you. Uh, I say get good ideas out of this. I'd, I've never thought about that one. Like I said, there's another one here from um, Daniel. He's saying if you want to eliminate the risk, why not look to remove the t traffic controller from the side of the road and have a mechanised system, um, mobile, mobile traffic lights, so on? Yeah, I think I think we're actually on this journey of of change. Um, you know, having a traffic controller stood facing down a 55 ton truck, I'm not a big fan of. You can tell by the accent, I don't originate from Australia that. In the UK, they, they manage traffic rather than control it, so they use more and bigger equipment and less people. And I think there is a balance of both. I think that public interface in urban environments is really strong because you're then dealing with people as well as cars, so I think there is a balance. But we've recently undertaken some trials in Queensland using traffic lights to replace the person who stood there. It's not just a traffic controller, remember, though. We could have up to 40 people stood not too far from the traffic controller. So whilst we could eliminate the traffic controller, we can't eliminate those people. But actually, if we can change driver behaviour, we can make it entirely safer for everybody, including the driver. The odd thing is, and this is the, I think it's a fascinating fact, if people as they approach roadworks slow down to 40 kilometres an hour, yeah, they will get home quicker because the, the indifferent speeds create natural traffic jams. So the guy travelling at 40, the lady comes up behind at 80, she has to slow down rapidly, hit her brakes. 15 cars later, the traffic stops. So the actual irregular speed and the person going too quick creates the traffic jam, which causes a congestion, which causes the angst, which causes the abuse, and you can see how it Snowballs out. Snowballs out. I bet, bet a lot of people don't wouldn't know that. I think um, I saw Vic Rhodes' presentation where the best thing people could do on the morning rush hour was just stay in their lane and they'll get to work quicker and they'll get home quicker instead of jumping across lanes. So I'm sure there is some data behind that and it's factual um, and that, that creates congestion itself. That was a key message of the uh, TRC towards zero. It was. You were at the same conference, weren't you? Yeah, yeah there was a uh, head of uh, Vic Rose made yeah. that point. Just, John Merritt. Was John Merritt. Just yeah. don't change lanes. Uh, you increase your risk and, and it affects traffic flow. Yeah, and really, I'm, I'll come on today because I just want a bit of help. You know, we've got, we've got 2,000 people out on the network. You think we, I don't know, there'll be 10,000 people on Australia's roads every night. That's the reality of it. Trying to do a job trying to contribute to society, and as much as you might think it's an inconvenience, it will be a far bigger inconvenience if we didn't fix them. You know, There's a reason we're a first world country, we have economic status, we can move freight, we can move people, we can create value, and all we're doing is our little bit to contribute that. And if a hundred people on the call, or thereabouts, can go and change one person's behaviour, who can change another, the benefits to all of us are, are profound. You know, the reality is someone dies on Australia Road, so a lot of people feel it. And you know, none of us want to end up in that and we treat a road work zone like the majority of people treat a school zone, you know, it would give us a greater chance. It would actually you know, the reality is we'd be more efficient, we could do more, we could charge less, it would save you money in your tax bill. It's, there's a whole series of added benefits. You know, I can tell you many examples of people who have been involved in accidents first hand and the reality is you don't know if it's going to be you who causes it. 
and it is not a good place to be. I'll speak from the death of my first boss, and it still haunts me to this day. Do something to change other people's behaviour, and indeed your own. And I think that's what a lot of people don't realise, that 80 to 90 percent of most traffic crashes, that they just happen. These are things which are momentary spurs. So if you can try and everyone takes responsibility and just shares that out, we can reduce that risk. So how would you sleep better at night if, if people took stepped up more? Would you have a greater rest? How do, how do you find the, the, the pressure you have to deal with with that many people out on the road? I, well, you see the bag, well, Jerome can see the bugs <laughs> under my eyes. I, I, I've never slept particularly well. Listen, we do a lot of work to try and manage our risk on our work sites. We try and engage. We we, we try and use near miss. We have some really stringent critical controls. We have good practice in place. I'm much happier when I feel as though we can we can control our risk. And many of the near misses reported are, are things that we need to change and we can then control. Third party public is the one where it is really, really difficult to control and you're almost at risk from other people's behaviour rather than your own actions. If we could get people to follow some of the simple rules and help us on the journey and provide good feedback, you know, of what we do well and what we do badly, then it will give us a give us a better chance. And I might sleep a little bit better. This is where I think it's a good one we can feed in. There's a question here from Ian. Could we better utilise social media such as Twitter for motorists to provide feedback and for contractors to inform and update the public? As long as they're not driving while they do it. Yeah, I was just about to say. I think I think now the whole platform of of how we interact is changing. You know, cars are getting smarter, drivers are getting better informed. You know, if if you look at what government are doing around some of the journey time reliability stuff. So if you're going from here to there, it's going to be eight minutes. So we are getting a bit smarter. I think I think we we always struggle to keep up with technology, but I think there is a lot of effort going into that space. So I think, yeah, we could. We, you need to have smart technology to match it, of course. It needs to know, pointless sending somebody a message saying that road works, you're approaching as a 40 when you're going in the other direction. We've used the telegraph system. So this is a, a system where you put a message out over the radio waves as people approach. Now that was done in a trial again in Queensland for TMR and it's, it's what are used in many of the tunnels. So now as you're in the tunnels, you'll get a message on your radio if there's an incident telling you what to do. Um, you're not allowed to use it in a, because of broadcasting regulations, I understand, wholesale. So, But in some specific um, areas, we, we have seen that, and that provides a better informed public, which is a key part of what we've got to do. It's quite comforting when you're in the tunnel and you've got your radio on and you hear a message, you feel like, well, you know, they're keeping you in the loop. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I thought it was brilliant, and you know that that little snippet of information allows you, as a driver, to make choice and decisions, which I think promoting that's a really good thing. Are, are you aware of any states where they actually coordinate that, that journey plan, where you can go online, you can see all what's going on? So if I'm journey, doing some journey management, so I'm going from A to B. If I check that on site, and I go, wow, I want to avoid these sort of spots, or I, I, I couldn't answer that honestly and say I absolutely know. What I can tell you is I went on my iPhone the other day and I put it in my journey and it showed me red routes on an iPhone so I don't know where that information came from as to where congestion naturally sit. So there is information available and I'm sure there will be people far cleverer than me on the call who, who know where that's available from but I understand it's becoming wider available yet. And Daniel just came through saying the same thing. Google Maps, yeah. Thank you, Daniel, Pretty for your support on that. Um, but it is, and, and we are. But people have got to take the time to check, be prepared, and you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm just old-fashioned, but some of it just comes down to good old-fashioned manners. How often these days, as a motorist, when you know lanes are merging, do you see you put your hand up and wave and say thank you, and there's no reciprocation. It's almost as though. As society, we're becoming intolerant of each other, or time is that critical that you haven't got a second to spare. I actually think if people understood the, what time really costs them over what it could save them, we, we might be in a better place as well. 
Great, and Jerome, is any question standing out for you as we start to go towards the end of our webinar? Um, there's, a, there's always, there's a, we always have a plethora of questions coming through, so we try and feed them on through. But um, I'll let uh, Jim move on a little bit more, and, and we're coming, I know we're coming up to the end, but I'll grab a couple more and tick. Awesome. So I'm old fashioned. You get nothing for free in life, so and never be disappointed with a no. But it's always worth asking the question. So on the call, what could you do to help? The reality is everybody could set the example. Actually, slow down and have patience. And the, particularly if you've got young people in the car with you, that behaviour, as you've seen in one of the adverts of the, the young child on the string, you know, young people follow examples. And if you set that example, it can only be a, a good thing. If you raise awareness with your friends and family, not just at roadworks, but particularly when you're moving your vehicle around your property, that the risk to young people is profound. 17 young people have died being run over by relatives. At least take that message back home. Think about how you park your car. Think about where the locks on your doors are, particularly with young children. Raise your awareness in your organization. See if you can get change. You, you guys represent and girls some big organizations from what I understand and do something positive around that. And, and get involved. You know, as I say, within seven steps, you can touch everybody else in the world, apparently, or 4.2. If you could do something proactive and, and change the status quo, we don't have to accept it. It would really, really help what we're trying to achieve and help keep our people safe. Yeah. We've got two good questions here as well, like what can you do? I think this actually <coughs> draws onto some solution sort of focus as well. Like One is around total removal of traffic control of people is often limited by state government regulations. Is it different from state to state? Um, yes. So we, we, we don't have a harmonised traffic control law in Australia. One law would actually make it easier for us as practitioners, but it would make it far more reliable for the public to understand, particularly anybody who drives in the state to understand that is a set of signs that mean roadworks are coming. So that, that standard would be would be well received, I, I believe. And this is where Melvin's actually a good one in here. And this is, is a good agreement for councils. So getting some leadership from them around data standards for road alerts, working with suppliers, etc. as well. Any any source of accurate data is well received. We we have a comprehensive system where we can we, we've set it up to use data, because quite often, you know, people's perception tends to be their reality. You know, people's perception. Um, for example, every road works. There's no work going on. You never know. That's not always true. But if we can, the more data we can amass, the better our decision making will be around where we put the efforts in to get the best outcomes be it councils, be it at skill zones. And you know, to hear that, uh, I can't remember who it was earlier who said his wife had stopped reporting. You know, that, that's the worst thing that can happen. Really, you know, we've got to keep people, we've got to be relentless about reporting. It's the only way you bring change is by saying something. You know, almost silence is consent. You know? And if you think back to that reporting, if the council's been receiving that warning in a trend in an area and then a young child is hurt, no one's acted on that. Oh, God forbid, that's the worst. That's, God, that's the worst question you're going to answer, isn't it? I mean, silence is consent, isn't it? When that's that was a famous advert from some years ago, is, um, and that was that was around people who got hurt at work, on that on that on that um, on that advert. But you, you've got a voice; you need to use it. I mean, God forbid, I've got an eight and a six-year-old girl. They go across three school crossings every day. You know what, I actually feel, I feel better that they're going across a school crossing because of demand. There's some fabulous people. These are these are true volunteers to the community who put who are selfless and put other people first. You know, I've, I've always held the, the skill zone as, as something that we should be incredibly proud of. And to see people's behavior change has always given me hope that they can change in a work zone. Um, no, if, if you're seeing something different in the skills zone, it needs to be raised to the skill. The skill need to act upon that. I know for a fact, my two little girls, if I saw anything, I will be straight on the floor. I'm a six and a four year old and I totally align with you there, Jim. And, and the reality is, in the very start, it was skills zone versus work zone. I probably wandered off in 
a million different directions and gone off topic. But the reality is there's no difference. It's exactly the same people. It's exactly the same circumstance. A slightly different audience and a slightly different user. But you know, any failure in either results in catastrophic harm. I don't want catastrophic harm in either. I just want you know people to be able to go about their business safely. And you know, let's see what we can do to, to drive some change. Thank you very much, Jim. It's been a pleasure having you here. And I knew this was going to be a fantastic webinar. And thank you, everyone, for the fantastic questions I've heard, and Rosemary for helping uh, facilitate it as well. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for the awesome webinar, Jim, and for coming in.